I'm uh, certainly glad to be back, and it's certainly a, a privilege to be invited to be with you in your summer series. I uh, love the, the theme of this series. Jesus calls us, Come unto me, all ye that labor heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. He calls us for blessing. And so uh, we certainly are, are thrilled, and it's a blessing for us to be here with you. Good to see Sam again, and Julie, and to see the grandbabies, and uh, Kelsey, and even Chewy. Uh, but we are glad to be back, and certainly for such an occasion as this. Jesus spoke unto his disciples, and as he did, he emphasized for them that his desire was that we would be of good cheer. In fact, as we listen to him in the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, the Beatitudes, blessed are, that's how he begins each one of those, it's the idea of happiness, the idea of joy, and in the context of New Testament Christianity, it takes it to greater heights indeed. The Apostle Paul wrote to a congregation in the first century, and the theme of the book that he wrote centered upon the joy that we have in Christ. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice, as we see in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4. You go through that four-chapter book, and you will see in that context that the word joy or a form of that word is going to be found at least 16 times, four times per chapter. You and I understand and we realize that as New Testament Christians, we have access to all spiritual blessings, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. That you and I have been made acceptable in the Beloved, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4. We have been redeemed by His blood, Ephesians 1 and verse 7. As we go through that context, he emphasizes for us that we have occasion to rejoice. And so you and I understand that. We recognize that. In fact, as you go to the fourth chapter where he began, verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. He speaks of the power of prayer that we have, verse 6. He speaks of the peace that passes understanding, verse 7. He speaks of that focus that we ought to have, thinking on things that are honest and lovely and just and pure and of good report. He emphasizes that we can do all things through Christ, verse 13. And then finally, in verse 19, he says, My God shall supply all your needs. You and I, as New Testament Christians, we have occasion to rejoice. And when Jesus calls us, that's what he calls us to. That's what he calls us for, that he wants us to rejoice. However, as we go through Jesus' teaching, we recognize that Jesus showed us, number one, in his life. He taught his disciples, and then they would teach us that as we go through this life, making the choice to experience all spiritual blessings, that we are going to be called upon to pay a price. Because we live in a world that is contrary to, that is up down, upside down, as far as blessings, genuine blessings, are concerned. In fact, we live in a world that has a hard time comprehending the spiritual level, really, on any matter, at any time. It wasn't something, or isn't something new for us today. We realize that Jesus had the same problem while he was here on earth. He spoke of, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it again, John 2. People thought, He's talking about the physical temple, but he is talking about the resurrection from the dead. He told Nicodemus, you must be born again. Nicodemus thought of physical birth. He is talking of a spiritual birth. He talked to the woman at the well, told her that if you knew who you were talking to, you would ask me for water, and you'd never thirst again. And she said, give me this water so I don't have to come down to the well every day. And so we understand that that's the way things are. That's just the way it is. But because of that fact, if you and I are going to live the way that we want to, if we are going to make that choice to follow Jesus, then it comes with the price. And Jesus told us that price. In Luke chapter 9, in verse 23, Jesus said, If any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Now, I've often wondered what the disciples thought in their mind when Jesus said that statement, when he said, take up your cross daily and follow me. Jesus hadn't been crucified at this point. As far as they knew, 
They had no idea that he was going to die on the cross, and yet that's the language that Jesus used it. Later in Luke chapter 14, in verse 27, he said, If a man will not take up his cross, then he's not worthy of me. He can't be my disciple if that's the case. Now, certainly they must have understood what the cross was. That was something that was prevalent in the day. That was something that was used by Rome. They would have understood what the cross was. They would have known that the cross was not a tool of corporal punishment, but rather the cross was a tool of capital punishment. It was the death penalty when someone was sentenced to be crucified. We, of course, remember that that's how our Lord died. We glory in the cross. Paul said, I've determined to know nothing among you save Christ and Him crucified. And we see that language throughout. In fact, we even read of it hundreds of years before when David wrote Psalm 22, the Psalm of the Cross, a poetic version of the death of Christ on the cross. What's so interesting about that? is that's, uh, what, thousand years before Christ was even walking on the earth? But what's even more interesting, it's about 400 years before anyone would ever die on the cross. Before they even invented the crucifixion, David explained it, talked about it, told in a poetic way what was going to unfold. But one thing you and I know, that when Jesus said, take up your cross daily and follow me, that Jesus was indicating there was going to be a price that must be paid if we're going to follow Him. That it wasn't going to come easy. That it wasn't something that was going to be approached in a lackluster way. It wasn't something that we would be able to approach lackadaisically, lazily, half-heartedly. It's not a hobby. It's not something that we dabble in. But it's something that we have to make a choice, we have to make a decision, and we have to make that decision with great determination. With great determination. Now what I want us to do for a little bit this evening and the time that we have, is I want us to consider a New Testament Christian. And I want us to look at his life as it unfolds and as it goes through, and see exactly in a practical way what is it to take up your cross daily? What does it mean? Now, when we do that, we're going to open our Bibles, if you will, with me to the book of 2 Timothy. And when we open to the book of 2 Timothy, we'll remember that this is, you probably remember this from a past study that you've done, this is the last book that the Apostle Paul would write, as far as we know. And he was writing unto Timothy, it's coming to the end, and now he is encouraging Timothy. We're going to get to that book in just a moment. And that will be toward the end of Paul's life. But I'd like us to go back to the beginning, not all the way back to the beginning of his life, but the beginning of his choice to follow Christ. We remember Acts chapter 9. And in Acts chapter 9, we find the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. We're familiar with that chapter. Saul of Tarsus was told... In this conversion account, what great things he would suffer for the cause of Christ. Verse 16. That when you make this choice, and I've chosen you to be an apostle to the Gentiles, I've chosen you for a specific work, Paul, and when you make this choice, you're going to suffer because of it. Well, we know how it unfolds, don't we? We remember Paul talking about it in Acts chapter 2 when Ananias comes to him finally. He's there, he's blind, he's been there, he's been mourning, he's been fasting. And finally Ananias says, Why tarest thou rise and be baptized? Watch away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Acts 22 and verse 16. And so he does that. Now notice, keep your thumb on 2 Timothy. We'll get there in just a moment. But in Acts chapter 9, a verse that uh, sometimes may be overlooked... It is very interesting. And that is verse 22. It says, But Paul, or Saul rather at this time, Saul increased in more in strength and confounded the Jews that were in Antioch, proving that this is very Christ. Now, that's a little bit awkward in the wording. Basically, what Paul is doing is he is there confounding the Jews, proving 
that Jesus is Messiah, that Jesus is Christ. That word proving, very interesting word. It means to bring together, to bring side by side. And it has the idea of when you bring it side to side, that it fits like a glove. And so what Paul's doing, obviously, is he is going back to the Old Testament Scriptures that talked about Messiah. And he is bringing Christ, Jesus, he's bringing Jesus side by side with it and showing how Jesus perfectly fulfills these prophecies so that he could conclude the very Messiah that you were looking for, that you read of in your Scriptures, you should have recognized him when you saw Jesus because he fulfilled this. In Acts chapter 17, he went into the synagogue in Thessalonica. He was there three Sabbath days. He was opening and alleging and reasoning from Scripture. Number one, that Messiah must needs die. Suffer and die. He hadn't even introduced Jesus yet. He's going back to the Old Testament. The Messiah you're looking for, your Scriptures say he had to suffer. Isaiah 53. Your Scriptures say he had to die. Psalm 22. Zechariah 13. And then he concludes, Jesus is Messiah. He is Christ. That's what Paul was doing. When he was converted, that's what he was converted for. That's why you and I are converted, by the way. So that we can go out and prove that Jesus is Christ. That he is Messiah. When Jesus Christ told the disciples to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, to go and make disciples, that comes down through the ages and sits right at yours and my front door. That's our responsibility. We need to be prepared. We need to be equipped. We need to be able to rightly divide the Word of God, be able to take Scripture and show men that Christ is the Messiah. Bring them side by side. That word proved is used in another verse, Colossians chapter 2 and verse 2, where it says that the Christians were knit together, knit together is that word, in love. And so they came together because of the love they had one for another, that it formed a very beautiful tapestry. And so that's what Paul was doing, taking Old Testament Scripture, the life of Christ, evident life of Christ, things that were done out in the open, not in the dark, not in a corner, not in a closet, and weaving them together, blending them together to form a beautiful tapestry that proclaimed Jesus is Lord and Christ. That's what the Apostle Paul was doing. Now, as we follow Paul's life, as we follow Paul's life, what do we see? We see his evangelistic zeal does not seem to wane. There'll be times when he's a little bit, there's a little bit of trepidation with him, remember? When he went into, when he was going into Corinth and he received the Lord, appeared to him again and said, Go, nobody will do anything to you. But we see a man full of zeal. We see a man whose desire is, I want to reach as many people as I can and I want to show them how all of it fits together so that they can recognize Christ so that they can see Him for who He is, so that they too can exalt Christ and in so doing glorify God in heaven. That's what Paul was doing. And because of that, what we see running parallel is that Paul paid a price. Paul had to pay a very heavy price for what he accomplished for the Lord. We could, if you would, open your Bibles to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Get a little bit of an idea, at least, uh, of what Paul was going through. He says, I'm going to begin with verse 22. He's talking about the Judaizing teachers, talking about those who are opposing Paul in his work. And he says, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. They claim to be Jews. They're claiming to be faithful to God. They're claiming to be Israelites. Well, I, I'm all of that. Are they ministers of Christ? Now, he's talking about Judaizing teachers in the church, is what he's talking about. He's not talking about Jews over here that are separate and apart and who would rail against Christ. He's talking about Jews that have obeyed the gospel, but now what they're teaching is that men have to be channeled through Judaism before they can become a Christian. That's what he's talking about there. 
And so he goes on to say, they claim to be Jews and they claim to be Israelites or are they the seed of Abraham? Well, so am I. Are they ministers of Christ? Are they really and truly serving Christ? He says, I speak as a fool, I am more. Now, I can imagine how uncomfortable Paul must have been as he made that statement. He says, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool, I am more. That type of language is contrary to the attitude of the Apostle Paul. It's contrary to the attitude of Christ, isn't it? Really. And the reason he's doing this, really twofold. Number one, they need it. Number two, the Holy Spirit's guiding him to write it. And we've got to keep that in mind. It's not his arrogance. It's not his pride. He's very uncomfortable with this. But here he goes. He said, I am more in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths off. Remember there was a time when he was stoned and left for dead? That wasn't a single occasion that happened once. That must have been other times when he was face to face with death. In deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes save one. You know on that third or fourth or fifth time that it happened... When they took his clothes off, his shirt, his, or his jacket, his, his clothing, I, I kind of wonder what must have gone through the mind of the one that was about to administer the fourth beating of 40 stripes, say one, or the fifth beating of 40 stripes, as they saw the marks from the earlier ones. And yet here he is again. Why? Because I'm a Christian. Why? Because I'm taking up my cross daily. That's what I'm doing here. That's what Paul is doing. He goes on and says, uh, uh, Thrice I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck, and night and day have I been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fasting often, in cold and nakedness, Beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. What are you doing, Paul? I'm taking up my cross daily. That's what I'm doing. I'm paying a price. There's a price to it. I'm reminded of the Hebrew writer's words. In Hebrews chapter 2, when he says, oh, you need to take care lest you let these things drift. And he goes on and says, we haven't yet resisted unto blood. That's you and me right there, folks. We have not yet resisted unto blood. Paul couldn't say that. Not by any means. We could go on. Our first century brethren lost everything. Philippians chapter 3, Paul says, This is everything that I had. I was a Jew of Jews. I stood among my peers. He said, I circumcised the eighth day of the tribe of Benjamin. Concerning the law, the strictest sect, I was a Pharisee. I was blameless concerning the law. My zeal, I was persecuting Christians. Not one of the Judaizing teachers that opposed Paul, not one of them didn't envy those credentials, I'm sure. And he says, I count it all loss. I give it up. It's gone. Why? So I can be a Christian. So I can follow Christ. So I can give my life for Him so that I can receive glory, so that I can be with Him in eternity. That's what I want. I'm willing to pay the price. And so that's what Paul is doing. Then we come to 2 Timothy. Open your Bibles there with me. It's a thrilling context. Thrilling. We come to the end. It's the second Roman imprisonment. It's really much different than the first time that he was in Rome. You remember the close of the book of Acts. And Paul is in his own rented house. He's able to receive guests who come in, and he teaches them, and he's uh, proclaiming truth, and he's teaching the gospel. He's converting individuals. There are even some in Caesar's house. Uh, we learn that they're converted because of the apostle Paul. This is much different here. And, and the mechanism, the machinery is already in motion now when we get to the close of Paul's life and when he writes this epistle to young Timothy. In fact, he tells us as we look in 2 Timothy chapter 4, I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. Is at hand. Present tense. It's on me. It's right here. 
The gears are turning. The mechanism's going through. The machinery is on its way. And it's not going to be long until I am dead. Until I lay down my life. Until my life is taken away from me. That's here. He goes on in chapter 4. And he tells uh, uh, Timothy, verse 9, Now, do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. Did he make it? We don't know. I don't know if he made it. You don't know if he made it. I'd like to think that Timothy did make it. But think for a moment with me what it must have been like if he did. Here is his mentor, the Apostle Paul. Here is one, you read through the book of Acts, that labored very closely with the Apostle Paul, who was there with him, serving him, ministering to his need. He's there sharing in the victories. He's there sharing in the conversions. He's there sharing in the blessings that come when we're faithful in Christ Jesus with the Apostle Paul. And now Paul says, I want you to come. And by the way, Timothy... The machinery's already in motion, and my life is about to end. But he tells him, I'm ready to be offered. The word offered is a technical term. It would have been the word that would have been used of the sacrifices of the Old Testament. I'm ready. I'm ready to be poured out. A, a drink offering is the imagery that we see in this language. And so Paul, knowing that if Timothy does come as he requests that this is going to be a little bit of a challenge for Timothy. How's he going to handle this? Imagine for a moment that you're there and your mentor, one you have spent time with, that you have invested energy with, that you've labored with, you've been there with the tears, you've been there with the sweat, you've been there with the blood, and now he's asked you to come and be with him. He's at the, the last moments of his life here on earth. How's Timothy going to handle that? Well, let's go back to chapter 1 of 2 Timothy. And in chapter 1, verse 8, listen to what the Apostle Paul says to him. He says, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, or of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. There's an invitation that Paul has made. You come be with me, Timothy. Do your diligence to get here as quickly as you can. I don't know how long I have for this earth. But when you get here, don't you be ashamed of the gospel. Don't you turn your back on God. Don't be ashamed of me, his servant, his minister. Don't you be ashamed of us. When they take me out there and that Roman raises up that sword and he cuts off my head and that's what we learn through secular history. That's how the Apostle Paul died. He said, don't you waver. Don't you be ashamed. He goes on. Listen to what he says as he continues on. He says in verse 9 of chapter 1, who has saved us, he's talking about the, the power of God, the gospel, and God has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. Here's the invitation, you see. Follow Jesus. Come unto Jesus to do what? Bear your cross daily is what we're talking about. And he goes on and says, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus, who hath abolished death and has brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. It's worth it, Timothy. It's worth it. Don't you be ashamed. Don't you bow your head. Don't you back up and back away from me, his servant. He's going to tell us why he's, going, he's where he is right now. Why is Paul here? Why is it that he is sitting there on death's row. He's about to face the executioner. He's going to be uh, punished. He's going to be punished as a capital offender. He's going to give his life. And he says in verse 11, why? Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. 
That's why, Timothy, right there. And he uses three different terms, and they're very interesting terms. They are terms that uh, apply, of course, in, in positions that men hold in the church. Some very limited number. He was, he says, an apostle of Jesus Christ. We remember he started out with 12. Judas went and killed himself. Matthias took his place. And then Paul was an apostle out of due season. So there were 14 apostles altogether. Judas killed himself before he could do the work. Matthias replaced him, and then Paul comes on the scene. I'm an apostle. I was sent by Christ. There were qualifications for apostles. Remember when Matthias was being chosen. He had to be there to witness the baptism of Jesus, those events in between, even up to his resurrection. That was a qualification. Paul received those in a special way. He was sent by Christ. That's what apostle means. And he was sent directly by Christ. What he received, he said in Galatians chapter 1, I didn't receive from these guys. I didn't receive them from the other apostles. I didn't receive it from James. I received it from the Lord himself. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, when he takes up the topic of the Lord's Supper, he says, That which I received of the Lord delivered I unto you. And so he was an apostle, not one whit, behind the other apostles. He had the same authority, same ability, same responsibilities, and it's why he was here now with his head about to be on the executioner's block. He also says in verse 11 that I am a teacher of the Gentiles. Now, that stands as an affront to those that were opposing the Apostle Paul, those Christians that were opposing Apostle, the Apostle Paul the hardest the Judaizing teachers. I am a teacher of the Gentiles. And you know what Paul could say? I'm not channeling them through Judaism. When I teach the Gentiles, I don't teach them that they have to be circumcised. I don't teach them that they have to keep the old law. I teach them the gospel of Christ, which is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first, then to the Gentile. That's all that men need. That's why the Jews wanted him dead. That's why he's sitting where he is. He also begins it by saying, I am a preacher. A preacher. This word is very interesting in the Greek language. It's emphasized in this word. In the definition of this word, it is emphasized the message does not belong to him. The message is someone's, someone else's. It's the same idea as a herald would be used back in the days of old. The king would give a message to a herald, the herald would go out, and the only thing that he could do was speak what the king told him to speak. He dare not take anything off of it. He dare not add anything to it. His responsibility was simply to be a herald for the, mess for the message that the king gave him. Here is our king, Jesus Christ. Paul says, I am a herald for Christ. I can do nothing but preach the word. That's all I can do. I can't soft soap it. I can't uh, alter it. I can't take away from it. I can't add to it. I've got to preach it, and I've got to preach all of it. That's why I'm where I am, Timothy. That's why I'm where I am, you see. I wonder what it would have taken to get Paul to turn away from that attitude. Turn away from that idea. Paul, don't preach Christ anymore. I don't know that there's anything. Well, I really and truly believe there was nothing you could have threatened him with. And based on what we're seeing right here. You see, he's determined, I'm going to take up my cross daily. Remember his language? To live is Christ, to die is gain. Philippians 1.21. I'm crucified with Christ. Why? I'm taking up my cross daily. That's why. You see? And so, what would it have taken? You couldn't have gotten him to do anything different. You could not have persuaded the Apostle Paul. Paul, do you really and truly, really and truly, have to preach on marriage, divorce, and remarriage? You know, the teaching that Jesus had was hard. The Apostle said that in Matthew chapter 19, didn't they? After he gave them the teaching, they said, Who can bear this? This is a hard teaching. Do you really have to preach that? Paul, do you really and truly have to preach 
that revelings and banquetings and such like are works of the flesh. You go look at those words in the Greek and the definition of those words. You will not be able to not be reminded of what you and I would recognize as the modern dance. That's embedded in those definitions. Paul, do you really have to say that's a work of the flesh? You know, our teenagers, they like going to the dances. They're juniors, they're seniors this year. They've got to go to the, to the, the proms. That's just part of it. Everybody expects them to. Do you really have to preach that? What would Paul have said? I'm a herald. I can't change the message. King gave me the message. Here's the message. Paul, do you really and truly have to teach that the infeminate and the abusers of mankind with man is a sin? That's homosexuality, by the way. Do you really have to teach that? Do you really have to teach that adultery is sin? Do you really have to teach that fornication is sin? We've got that, Paul, in the churches. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, they had it in the congregation in Corinth. The brethren in Corinth were puffed up about it. What's that mean? Looky here. Woo, look what we have among us. Now, I have a hard time understanding that, except for the fact that, that I know that the very early stages of Gnosticism were being taught. The Gnostics held a dualistic view. The docetic Gnostic had a dualistic view. Physical man's inherently evil, spiritual man's inherently good. They went two different directions with that, the Gnostics did. Some said because the physical man's inherently evil, then we need to punish it, asceticism, so that we can elevate the spiritual man. We can free the spiritual man that way. The others said because the physical man is inherently evil, really it doesn't matter. It's evil anyway. You just go do what you want to do, and you can ascend to such a high spiritual level that what you do in the flesh does not affect you. Which one do you think was more popular? <laughs> you see? And so here's the Corinthians. Here's a man that's in adultery, a young man going into, unto his father's wife as if she's his, adultery. And they're puffed up about it. Oh, look at us. Look how high we have ascended on this spiritual plane. We have this higher knowledge, this higher gnosis, and this sin down, this thing doesn't bother us at all. Paul says, I've already judged. Withdraw from that ungodly individual. Paul, do you have to be so hard? Do you have to be so black and white, cut and dried? Yes. I'm a herald. I can't change the message. I can't alter the message. We got preachers today in the Lord's church who are weak, who won't preach the whole counsel of God because it's not popular. We got preachers that won't stand firm for truth because God said it and he's a herald and he doesn't have the right to change it. And so what's he do? He compromises. Sometimes they'll teach the opposite. More prevalent are those who will never teach false doctrine, but they're not gospel preachers because they're not preaching the whole counsel of God. We need gospel preachers. And when we are gospel preachers preaching the whole counsel of God, keeping back nothing that is profitable, Acts 20, verse 20, and verse 27, then be assured we'll pay a price. But it doesn't apply just to preachers. It applies to Christians. You see, you are the church. Individuals make up the church. You're many members, yet but one body. Right? 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 20. And the church is the bulwark of truth. The pillar and ground of truth. 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15. The bulwark, the pillar and ground, that term there, that was the wall that they built around the cities. Go back to the Old Testament. You have examples of those walls. Jericho, for example. Why did they build those walls? protection, those things, those ones that were inside, they were protected from that which was outside. We are the wall, the pillar and ground, the bulwark of truth. You don't have to be a preacher to be responsible to preach the whole counsel of God, to teach the whole counsel of God. And we all have opportunities. We all do. 
Those teenagers who are Christians among us, they have a field that is white unto harvest. And they need to stand up for truth. They are in a setting where evil is glorified. They're in a setting where evil is the norm. They're in a setting where wickedness is expected. When they stand up, they will pay a price. They will. Don't try to tell them it won't happen because they're smarter than that, number one. And number two, it's not true. If you don't believe it, ask some of these young people if they've ever had occasion to stand up to their peers and say, you know, I can't do that. I'm a Christian. And ask them what the response was. You say, well, I'll have that responsibility. What about at work? I used to work, before I went to preacher school, I was an iron worker. I worked construction. Work construction, really, I've been in construction a lot of, of my life. Even after I started preaching, I supported myself building houses. It's a hard area to work in. It really is. And you're around those who definitely are not committed to godliness. And when you stand up, you stand out. And when you stand out... You get uncomfortable. But Paul says, that's okay. I'm a messenger. I'm going to preach. Well, Paul, you're about to give your life. You're about to pay the price. It's come down to this, Paul. Here you are, Second Timothy. He's writing to Timothy now. He can hear them sharpening the blade, perhaps, knowing that his time is coming. The gossip going through the, the prisoners Paul's going to be executed. Paul's going to be put to death. What now, Paul? What do you think now? You gave up your position as a high-ranking Jew. You paid a very hard price. You bear the marks of Christ in your body. What now? Are your eyes still sharp as they were when you stood face to face with those leaders of Rome, Felix and Festus? And Agrippa? Or is your head bowed down a little bit now? Because the price is coming. It's time to pay. Your hands still sharp and still. Or is it shaking a little bit? Notice verse 12 of chapter 1. You would be hard pressed to find a greater more simplistic statement of faith than what you find in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12. For the which cause, now what? He's talking about I'm a preacher, I'm an apostle, I'm a teacher of the Gentiles, and for this reason, for this cause, I also suffer these things. I'm where I am because of those three things. Three things that you and I are called upon, well, not three of them, but we're called upon to handle truth the way he did. And I'm here because of that. Nevertheless, where do you stand now, Paul? Your life's about to end. You want to take it back? Was it worth it? Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. I was ill-treated, mocked, ridiculed, beaten, left for dead more than once, often, he said. I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. I know. Two different words for know. Gnosis is one of them. That deals more of the process of knowing, of learning. The other word that is used here is a conviction of I know. The process is over. All the facts are gathered. My commitment is here. I know whom I have believed. It's interesting what he didn't say. He didn't say, well, I know Jesus. I knew the details of his life. He didn't say, I knew Jesus back when. He says, I know him. I know him today. I knew him yesterday. And I know him now. And I'll know him as long as I'm here. Commitment. I know whom I have believed. Present tense. I will continue to believe. I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I committed unto him against that day. 
I am persuaded. As a Christian tonight, I stand where I stand because I am persuaded that Jesus Christ is just that, the Christ. That He is the Son of God, that He is the Lord. I am persuaded that the life that you and I are in right now, this physical life, is temporal. That the joys and the pleasantries and the pleasantness of sin that comes for a season is just that for a season. And they are not worth my soul. I'm persuaded of that. I am persuaded that what my God has reserved for His faithful in heaven will be worth whatever price I have to pay here. Whether it be things, stuff, and junk, whether it be relatives or friends, there's not going to be one person. I am persuaded there will not be one person on the day of judgment when they here enter into the rest will step to the doors, the gates, and look into heaven and say, I paid way too high a price for this. Not one person is going to say that. I am persuaded that on the day of judgment, men who here depart from me, you worker of iniquity, I know you not. There will be those among them that will have great regret. Great regret. And will say something along the lines, at least in their mind, I should have whatever. Fill in the blank. You can put anything in there that keeps someone from being a faithful Christian. I should have laid that aside. I should have been a more dedicated preacher. I should have been a more dedicated elder. I should have been a more dedicated... And there will be some preachers down there, folks, and elders, and members of the body of Christ who are just kind of floating along and fail to realize and understand that Jesus calls us to bear our cross. You will not wear the crown if you do not bear the cross. You won't. You can't. Certainly appreciate the time's about up, isn't it? Got a minute, maybe two? None? Appreciate your attention this evening. Thank you.